Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today I am out in, well, it's a French car and it's quirky, but it's perhaps a little less quirky than the previous generation. Yes, this is a Mark II Renault Twingo. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classic, so check out the link in the description to find this and other interesting stock. And if you like reviews of interesting, different and unusual cars, make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons below. Now, a word from our sponsor and on with the review. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and we're going compact and French today with this, the second generation Renault Twingo. Now, back in 1993, Renault well, shocked the world with a beautiful, quirky, individual Patrick Le Quimont designed original Twingo, which was a beautiful little tiny city car with tons and tons of, well, just fantastic little design features that made it very, very special indeed. It was even more forbidden fruit fantastic here in the UK because they didn't do a right-hand drive version of it. That all changed in 2007 with this, the second generation Twingo, which, well, as is so often the case, it grew up and it grew up a lot. It suddenly became a far more mature, sensible, practical proposition than the previous generation. Let's take a little look around. There are two things that immediately stand out at you when you look at the car. First of all, it's a lot more sensible. It's no longer got the really individual, unusual styling. It's gone very much more, a bit like the Renault Wind actually, but more family face, a bit more grown up, a bit more sensible and blends into the crowd. It's also a fair bit bigger. I mean, it's still a small car, but it's a fair bit bigger than the previous version. And that's because it's now based on the Renault Clio 2 platform, which was the previous generation Clio at the time of this one's launch. That may not sound as exciting as previously, but that does mean it's no longer on a standalone platform. Being on the Clio platform, it has the access to the world of Clio. It's a little bit bigger in every dimension, but it's also a lot safer in every respect as well. So better crash safety for the occupants, which is absolutely a good thing. Better sized rear seats, more leg room, more headroom, more everything room. But being more sensible doesn't mean it's lost all of its individuality. Let's have a little look around at some of those little design tweaks. Then with this whole front end, which has a big one piece molding for the bumper, the grill area. The grill is basically just a little intake down here. There's no actual grill. So it's a very smooth, smiley, happy face. Big headlights, which as I say, look a lot like the Renault Wind headlights, which I think shared the same Renault Clio platform. Enormous for the size of the front of the car, Renault logo, with a big hole in the middle, like a belly button on the front of the car. It's like a big baby. Oh, cute. This isn't a bad looking front end of a car. However, it was considered too normal and not nearly weird enough. So in 2011, it was given a major facelift, but the headlamps became twin pod units and the general styling of the car dictated the whole family design language for the rest of the Renault range moving forward from that point. The back end of the car is almost remarkably unremarkable in its unremarkableness. It's a very square cam tail rear of the thing, almost flat rear window, actually bowing slightly towards the middle, but on a left to right convex rather than top to bottom. Little, little jut out over the tail lights, which has got three little indents like claw marks, like a panther or a puma or something, has been scratching your lights. And a fun, curious arrangement of the indicators and reversing lights and brake lights and all the rest of it. A printed stickery type logo. And like on the front, we do have little plastic protectors so if you nudge anything in the city because it is a city car after all and the French are renowned for their nudge parking uh, you do have a bit of protection just there this car though is absolutely pristine doesn't need it or well, hasn't needed it so far fingers crossed it stays that way the booty McBoot face has a little rubbery touch button underneath there to open it small load space cover and it's actually not a bad space boot for the size of the vehicle considering it's such a tiny tiny car you can get actually get a fairly um, respectable amount of stuff in here certainly it's bigger than an r50 mini's boot space probably on a par with an r56 um, you have got two lash down points one either side in the middle and you have got a folding rear seat oh, when you pull the little fabric tags in the back of it which is nice. Uh, you do not have, though, fabric on this rear edge of it. That's a little bit of the cost cutting that you see on cars in this class, just to kind of keep costs down. The bits you don't see, you don't get fancy fabric facings. So unlike in a, a family estate car, for example, there aren't curry hooks, there aren't lights, there's no power outlets, just a basic space for putting stuff. It does, however, have an actual proper spare wheel and jack under here, which a thousand out of 10 for doing that because no one wants to be stranded with a flat tire and a can of goop that does nothing. Now one of my favourite little quirks on this car is this door handle. There's an outward bulge 
on the door panel itself and an inward bulge on the side pressing and you put your hand inside there like on the original Renault 5 and you have a little handle you pull that and you're in it's not the most convenient thing to use but it's very fun to look at a nice and narrow dynamic as well I imagine I am surprised at how low the fuel filler is really really low down this must mean the fuel tank is right down in the floor of the car somewhere I guess Right, so the bonnet on this thing is very little, but that's fine because so is the engine. It's a 1.2 litre, 74 horsepower ball of fire. If you bought this car, you basically had two engine options, the 1.2 or the 1.2 turbo or the 1.5 diesel on this one for the Renault Sport, in which case you went for the 1.6, which really was a genuine ball of fire. And the Renault Sport version of this is in a hoot if you get your hands on one. However, as I say, there's only two engine options, which is the 1.2 or the 1.2 turbo, not available in every market, has to be said. It is, as you can see, a four-cylinder inline petrol, which is shared with the rest of the Renault range. Okay, now let's use those interesting door handles. Before we climb in though, it is only available as a three-door body shell, of course, being such a small vehicle. You can sort of see the Clio-ness about it when you look at this uh, B-post shape and rear window shape. Fixed rear window, of course, as well. I say, of course, he didn't know that. Quirky door handle, works effectively. Big door opening, really big opening, so you can climb in very easily indeed. We have got a largely plastic, I say largely, it's entirely plastic door card. So everything is similar shade of textured, like a, like a leather texture almost, but in hard plastic. And a, a fountain spray and a rotary engine piston loudspeaker grill, all interesting. Feels relatively solid, if quite firm and plasticky. Uh, electric windows for both the front windows. Nicely sculpted door handle, I think that is Renault parts bin. I think I've seen it in Clio's as well. Fairly small, but quite deep door pocket down there. And then we have the seats, which are wonderfully French in their patterning with this black with blue random, uh, like a DNA code pattern or a 1960s modern artist has been at work designing the fabric here. The outer panels are just a hard-wearing uh, grey curiosity. It does feel a lot like the uh, material used in the Dacia Sendera, so they've been uh, going down to River Island and buying suits to cut into seats, I think. Climbing aboard. Ouch. Okay, I thought I had a big aperture, but I just bashed my head on there, so... Oh, climbing aboard, mind your head, because you can clump it on this because this does roll down quite heavily into the side of the car. You have an entire hand width of space between the top of the door and where the ceiling rolls around. Now, important stuff first of all, tea shelf. We have a vast tea shelf here. You can have an entire boulangerie of snackage going on up there. If you want to take your tea break in the car, you are fine with this. Also of interest in this area, apart from your tea stowage options, which are this big triangular shaped here. Like they've contacted archeologists and found a giant Iguanodon's claw print and used that as a template for this wee cubby hole in here. It's molded plastic, so it's ideal for putting soup in on the move. Uh, on the other side, it is replaced with an airbag because they've done a center binnacle, which means they can flip it from left-hand drive to right-hand drive or vice versa with ease and limited expense. Great for keeping costs down on production. This area in the center is quite a curiously styled lump. We have basically got a miniature dashboard here in the middle. It's honey I shrunk the dash because they've got the passenger side dashboard the driver's side binnacle, then we've got the instrument panel here on the uh, driver's side bit. This has got your total mileage. This car's only done 9,500 miles. Big speedo, digital only, fuel gauge in Trivial Pursuit cheeses, and then our warning lights over here, and another small storage area for odds and sods down there. Central locking and hazard lights up here as well. Now I am curious by the upside down Poirot moustache of the air vents, which roll out like this. I don't know if you can see it's probably on camera. To get your ventilation going up and down, you roll the entire unit like that. How curious. I like that. It's kind of fun in its own way. Parts bin Renault rubbery roller for turning off and on and little ovoid air vents here on the side, which do the same thing fold down to your knees but don't go up to your face I guess that's as high as they want you to have it more of the same 1960s textured plasticky stuff headlamp leveling in case you put very heavy small things in the boot um, dimmer for the dashboard and in the center we have our ventilation which is pretty basic three dials a slider for recirculate or not and a button for heated rear window with a small light here in the center of each of the dials to let you know 
which way they're pointing in the dock. I genuinely don't know if this car is air conditioning. I would be amazed if it didn't, being a 2007 car, but it is the cheapest car in the Renault range, so maybe they did cut it out of there. Below that, we have got a curiously angled radio. I believe this is the standard fit item, CD player and an aux input, so it does a few things you need it to do. And that is in a sea of beige plastic because we have got a two-tone dashboard here, dark at the top, this light tan material, same as on the doors. It's all quite plastic, if I'm honest, but you know, does the job at the price point. Below which we've got a pen holder. I can't think of anything else is gonna fit in there. And tiny, tiny cup holders or perhaps glasses if you're wearing ski goggles for a child. Um, not actually that useful in terms of cup holderage because it's so low and the angle means you're gonna to struggle to get anything in there. 12 volt socket, very useful. Then moving back up top, we have got manually adjustable mirrors which takes me back. And you'll notice looking in the mirror, it has got a dotted line, so you've got the curve out thing for seeing a wider view when needed. Let's jump back over to the driver's side. We have the steering wheel. It's the same beige tone as the doors and the lower dash, maybe a shade or so darker. It's actually a surprisingly hard plastic thing. I was expecting it to be soft and rubbery, but it's not. It does have a bit of interesting sculpting in the middle. Renault badge and an airbag. Hiding behind it, we do have wipers with many functions on the right, below which we've got the little ubiquitous monolith of Renault steering wheel audio controls. Massive chunk of plastic with loads of buttons all over it. Um, and to the left hand side we've got our indicators, lights, even our fog lights and the horn. Horn test. Ooh, a less quirky part than I was expecting. Now moving back into the centre, finally we have got our five-speed manual gearbox. The other option was a five-speed automatic. You know the answer to that choice. And then we have a manual handbrake and a passenger seat. Climbing uh, into the back is a little tight for a fully grown adult. But you have actually got not bad knee room. Surprisingly good knee room as it goes. And surprisingly good headroom as well. I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised at how, how roomy it is. You have got a moulded in armrest in this plastic. It's almost like pretend wood they've done here. I think it's the, uh, the grain effect they're going for is meant to be like uh, the fancy timber in a Mercedes or something. But no, they've just got moulded it in plastic. They've even got the grain in the rings. Armrest, speaker, cubby hole thing. It does feel kind of plasticky. There are only two seat belts because it's not that big. Okay, let's get this thing out on the road. Right, let's get this show on the road. Now I have to be really careful watching my speed on that dial because you'll see it more clearly than I can because I've actually got, from my point of view, a bit of a cutoff halfway through the speedometer. So I can only see about three quarters of the speed, which does make it a little bit tricky. So please don't dob me into the roses if I creep over the speed limit because I can't really see the speedo. Maybe I'll just blur it for the entire thing. Now, seeing as the Clio was always a fantastic thing to drive, it's really no shock to discover that this is also pretty decent on the road. The driving position does feel like you're sitting a little bit high for, for my personal taste, but perhaps they're aiming it at smaller people, perhaps even aiming it at women. I don't know, that is something that designers do sometimes. They, certain cars have had the pedals angled to be driven in high heels rather than work boots, which you'll find in a transit van. The boots, not the heels. Overall, it's not a bad place to be. The seat is quite flat and there's not much in the way of lateral support, I don't think. And the stuffing of the seat is interesting too. It's, it's soft as you sink into it, then fairly firm beneath that. So you just kind of sit slightly into the seat. Headrest is good though. You can really kind of sit back into it for a long journey. The steering wheel feel, still feels like a fairly hard plastic thing, even after a few miles. I imagine it doesn't get any better with time. The control layout feels good though. The radio, for example, is just a finger width away from the gear shift. And the gear shift has a lovely throw to it as well. Just a lovely little, little tiny bit of notch to know you've done something, but light enough to be pleasant as you skip through the gears. And inside, the car does feel really roomy and airy. Just a really nice place to be. There's a little bit of a cut off in your vision from the edge of the roof line just there, but not significant. And it just feels like you've got a nice big space all around you. Just really just a nice place to be. It has got rack and pinion steering taken from the Clio. And of course it's electrically assisted. So it's very light and very easy to use. So that's one heck of a turning circle. Now I'll be honest, I couldn't find a 0 to 60 time for a 1.2 twin go this morning, so let's give it a quick go. 
all 74 horsepower, giving it their all. No rev counter, of course, so just going by ear, not really thrashing it too hard. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we seem to have reached an impasse on the 60 mile an hour thing. Is there a speed limiter on this car by any chance? It won't go above 50. I can't imagine there's a speed limiter on it, there's nowhere to set it. That's hilarious. Okay, fine. So, 0 to 60, not a thing. Uh, up a hill, anyway. That's quite amusing. You do find, that going up a hill, you do have to change down once or twice, because it is... Yeah, although it's 74 horsepower, it's, it's respectable for a car this tiny. Don't forget, the original Mini's had about 30. Um, it's not got bags of torque, but it does have great suspension. It's... Uh, struts and coils at the front, it's got a torsion bar at the back, anti-roll bars, both ends of the car. So you can wang it around a corner and it will go around it surprisingly well. Just doesn't want to accelerate up the hill. Oh, poor little car. It's basically a city car. Don't forget this is a city car. It's not a car designed to do high speed motorway 90 mile an hour autobahn blasts. And it does have discs at the front, drums at the back, ABS and electronic brake force distribution. So you can throw it around a little bit and have a wee bit of fun with the car if you want to. So that's a good thing. And best of all, it gets apparently 55 miles to the gallon. So that nine and a half thousand miles this car's covered over the last 15, 16 years, won't have used many gallons of petrol. Now this was a rival for cars like the Fiat 500, the Mini, well the one end of the Mini, the Coupe will be a rival for the Renault Sport version with the 1.6 in it. The Volkswagen up, that kind of thing. Although sitting slightly below the Clio in the size and model range, it's more of a rival to the KA than the Fiesta kind of cars. But being perhaps a less well-known model, it does add a, a certain amount of individuality to your driveway. One thing I have noticed about it, which you don't really find so much with, say, the Mini, for example, is the road noise. Hit 50 miles an hour or so. Oh, it can go over 50. And um, you do hear the tyres rumbling quite intrusively. But again, it's not a car that's going to be doing a lot of high-speed long runs, I wouldn't imagine. And the Mark II was re replaced in 2014 by the Mark III, where once again Renault embraced the quirk and made things a bit more standout different. But thankfully did keep it as a right-hand drive available car, so we can buy it here in the UK. Or could, anyway. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this less quirky but still interesting slice of French smallness. I've quite enjoyed it. If I was on the lookout for a small city car, this would certainly be on my list. Would it be on yours? Let me know in the comments and thank you for watching. So your job right now is to like and subscribe and my job right now is to go and find something completely different to drive next week. See you then.